and colleagues, uh, Professor Mike Danson, who's at Terry What now, and Professor Christine Cooper at Strathclyde University. Uh, we were the architects behind what became known as the Scottish Service Tax. The Scottish Service Tax was adopted by uh, the SSP and was actually um, taken and debated in the Scottish Parliament. What we're looking at, and, and to what extent this is radical, is debatable. To what extent, uh, you know, what we would argue is that it actually <coughs> addresses what is known as regressive taxation. The current taxation, tax system is actually regressive. So we're looking at ways we can work under the current legislation. And one area where you can work under the devolution se uh, settlement is actually on the question of local taxation. I must apologise. I've got a feeling that's fallen out right. <laughs> it's like it's rubbing against my tongue. And sometimes I keep slurring, so I do apologise. and I'll try and uh, cope with that. Um, but to start off, let's have a look at why is this crucial? Why is it important? Well, let's go to that great revolutionary, Adam Smith. What did Adam Smith tell us? He says, the subjects of every state ought to contribute to the support of government as nearly as possible in proportion to their respective abilities. That is, in proportion to the revenue which they respectively enjoy under the protection of the state. Well, that's Adam Smith. Hardly a radical revolutionary thinker. But what he's actually arguing for is the necessity to have a progressive tax system. What we've got at this moment in time is a regressive tax system. What do we understand by regressive and progressive taxation? A regressive taxation means that the poor pay proportionately more in terms of their income than the rich. So this system, we would argue, needs to be fundamentally reformed. How can this actually be done? Well, I think if we take a step back and we look at where, where are we at at the moment, and what you would argue is that we're suffering from what you would call <coughs> neoliberalism, and part of that neoliberal debate is dressing things up as freedom. But of course, freedom is a contested term. Freedom means all sorts of things to all sorts of people. But the again, the dominant theme of what freedom has come to be, it means the freedom to keep the money you earn for yourself. It means the ability that those with the power have got the right to use that power as they see fit. In other words, neoliberal ideology has really been honed and refined over the last 30 years. What we're actually looking at then is this, what Gramsci called, is the academy of consent. It's the dominance of one particular ideology. And so, to challenge this, you know, what can we do about this dominance of this ideology which suggests that freedom, the freedom to utilise your wealth as you see fit, what that actually does, it takes away from a wider view of what society should and could be. Now, we you know, so what can we actually do about this? How can we challenge this? Well, at this moment in time, if we look at the Scotland Act, the one area where there is some movement in terms of taxation policy is actually on local taxation. If we look at the Scotland Act, it tells us local taxes to fund local authority expenditure, for example, uh, council tax and non-domestic rates. This is one area where there is some movement. And as I said earlier, the council tax itself is regressive. The poor pay proportionately more. However, 
What we would argue then is what the Scotland Act does, it gives us the opportunity to look at a different type of tax system. And what we would argue is what we need is a local income tax system. In other words, reversing that regressive nature, we would look at trying to um, ensure that the better off pay proportionately <coughs> more. And if we look now at what's happened over the recent past when we've had the council tax freeze, of course, who's benefited from the council tax freeze? Well, proportionately, richer people have benefited from the council tax freeze because they tend to live in more expensive housing and therefore they're saving more of their uh, taxation, if you like. So what are the alternatives? Well, way back in 2006, we put the Scottish service tax before the Scottish Parliament. What did the Scottish service tax do? Well, what it actually did, it suggested that we should have a taxation level of 60% for the high income earners. And I feel a bit of a fraud when I'm stood here speaking at a radical independence conference because 60% taxation is not exactly radical. That was the level of taxation that was there under Thatcher. Thatcher's top rate of taxation was 60%. And here's me, radical revolutionary Jeff Whitton, <laughs> arguing for 60% taxation under the Tories. <coughs> but the point is that if we introduce such a tax, under the auspices of the <coughs> Scottish Service Tax, it would enable, it would enable that 80% of the population would be better off without <coughs> losing any of the services. Now, the Scottish Service Tax wasn't without its critics because one of the big issues it didn't tackle was wealth. And we hold our hands up to that. I actually got denounced, I got denounced for being a Keynesian. <laughs> the paper was sent off to Capital and Class, Capital and Class, it's a Marxist journal. This is nothing but Keynesianism. And I thought, well, fair enough, you know, hands up. <laughs> so what we've, what we've tried to do, and what is probably better to look at, is the alternatives. And of course, the land value taxation is a good, workable alternative, now being adopted by the Green Party. And I would suggest that we need to tackle, or we need to take seriously, local value uh, taxation. What do we mean, or what is meant by LVT? It is really that when land is privately owned, it is the landowners, rather than the community, who get the benefit of any increase in land value. So what you can quite clearly have, what you can quite clearly have, is you can have a, a piece of delicate land, which is you know, not worth a great deal, but you put a road in there, you put in sewerage systems, paid for by the state, what happens is that value, that land increases in value and the, the, the expenditure has come from taxpayers, but landowners are getting the benefit. <coughs> so local, um, an LVT would be one way forward in trying to tackle uh, that. If we take Scotland as a whole, what we've got is 19,460,000 acres of land, almost half owned by 969 people. That comes from Whiteman, who's uh, speaking at the, the conference today. And what we find, is these landowners, they are the major recipients of EU funding. We can look at the Duke of Roxburgh, owns 55,136 acres, developing a 48 wind turbine farm. He's generating 30 million a year from that. 17, 17 million is from subsidy. So we're seeing that increase in value of that land paid for by taxpayers but of course the benefit is not coming back to taxpayers, it's going to the individual landowner. Just one final point, if we really want to be serious about tackling 
deficits, we can look at the, uh, the work of Professor Fillon, who calculated that a one-off 20% wealth tax on the wealthiest 10% of the population in the UK would, would enable the national debt to be wiped out. So it is these very small measures which we can take, which are not going to cause hardship. I do not believe that the 10% of the population, if they're going to pay an extra 20% one-off tax, are actually going to queue up, be queuing up at the Dole office next week. So I'll leave you with those thoughts, and thank you very much indeed. Jeff and sprinting across to the to the left down there is James Medway, who's a senior lecturer at the New uh, Economics Foundation, and his work largely focuses on uh, uh, on developing responses to the recession and austerity. So, welcome, James. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for, for the invite to, to speak. Uh, I'm also going to start with a, an apology, although not, I mean, not, not a medical uh, condition this time, touch wood at least. Uh, some, something much worse, actually, because uh, I wanted to start talking about George Osborne uh, and, and David Cameron. The, David Cameron, earlier this week, you'd have seen, he, he suddenly pops up after some period of time where Osborne in particular had been pushing this line, you know, I'm supposed to be working on the recession, the recession's over, so that's me, you know, adds to the job, presumably. Um, the recession's over, growth has returned, everything's great, and then Cameron pops up this week to say, well, there are red warning lights, that was his phrase, across the world economy, there are red warning lights out there, you know, be afraid, be very afraid of what's happening, Japan going back into recession, uh, the Eurozone continuing into stagnation, red warning lights across uh, the whole of the global economy. Of course, he misses the biggest red flashing warning light of all, which is the one hanging over us and hanging over uh, the economy that we all happen to live in. Because if you look at what has happened over the last four years, the record of absolute, complete and near total failure on the part of this government is quite something to behold. Really quite something. They had one thing they were supposed to be doing. One plan. I mean, God knows, they, then the Lib Dems have rowed about everything over the last four years or so, everything under the sun. But they've stuck to this like glue. One thing they were going to do, austerity. The biggest programme of spending cuts for generations in this country. And the misery that that's involved. Only too familiar with people in this room. Misery, by the way, if you saw the Financial Times last week, and they were quite right in this, that we're only halfway through, if that, the uh, current forecast for austerity. There is at least, at least another £45 billion pounds worth of cuts to come all the way through to the end of this decade. So we're kind of halfway through it. Their plan and their grand claim was that this would reduce government debt, this would reduce the pile of borrowing that the government had mounted up, the state had mounted up over time, and it would shrink the government's deficit, it would close the gap between what the government gets in taxes and what it spends <laughs> on public services and everything else. Over the last year, the deficit has risen by 10%. Over the last year, the government is borrowing 10% more this year than it was last year. That if you look at Osborne's original targets uh, produced by his good friends in the Office of Budget Responsibility, this independent body that he set up in the Treasury stuff by Treasury stuff that produces the government's independent forecast, they have actually moved out of the Treasury now to be If you look at their original forecasts, that for this year, uh, they were expecting the uh, government uh, now to be borrowing £40 billion. Pounds. The deficit would have fallen to £40 billion. Pounds. The government is actually borrowing over £100 billion for this year. They've missed their target, their original target, by £60 billion. Pounds. That's one target miss. The next one, we're going to start bringing the debt back into line. The figures in this are incredible. You hear it sometimes repeated, and it's right, that this government has borrowed more in the last four years has added more to the debt than the previous Labour government did in 13 years. That is true. Of course, it's also true that the government has added more to the national debt, to the public debt, in the last four years than every single Labour government in history has added to the total stock of debt of this country. They borrowed another £517 billion pounds in total. Now, if you're two things that you're going to say you're doing, you're going to bring the debt back under control, you're going to close the deficit, and you miss these catastrophically, 
What you're looking at is a record of near total failure on any single thing that you set yourself as to what you're going to do. The only, the only bright spots they can point to is that GDP is going up. Well, hip hip hooray, we've heard some of the problems just now, of course, with gross domestic product as a measure uh, of anything. And, of course, that jobs are being created. But therein <coughs> lies the problem. Because, yes, jobs are being created, this is true. But what jobs they are. What an extraordinary proliferation of zero-hours contracts. And the one that I particularly, I wouldn't say like, but is particularly striking is this increase in self-employment, exceptional increase in self-employment over the last 18 months or thereabouts. This has driven the bulk of job creation up until around about this point. Now, if you're Ian Duncan Smith, and I'm sorry, it's kind of a gallery of rogues I'm bringing out here. If you're Ian Duncan Smith, you'll claim this is a, a glorious return to, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit. This is what we're supposed to be doing, setting up our own businesses and the rest of it. That would be somewhat more convincing if it wasn't also the case that uh, real wages for those in self-employment, real earnings for those in self-employment, have fallen by 22% over the last four years. That does not sound to me like uh, a glorious flourishing of the entrepreneurial spirit. That is people forced out of relatively more secure full-time or part-time employment with an employer and pushed into dubious forms of self-employment over here where they're scraping a living. And no doubt, part of that, of course, is the clampdown on how you can get you know, unemployment benefits, JSA, and all the rest of it. These pushing people into claiming to be self-employed. But this is a completely sham recovery. This is a completely sham recovery for most of us when you see that real wages, real earnings for most people have fallen by about <laughs> 10% over the last six years or so. They've fallen every single year for six years. This is the longest, just to be clear in this, the longest sustained decline in living standards for most people in this country since official records began in 1856. This is worse than the Great Depression. This is worse than the, the lesser known first Great Depression in the 1870s. This is an extraordinary period of decline. And how dare the government turn around and try and pretend that this is all a success, everything here is great, it's the rest of the world you have to worry about. No, of course not. It's here that the red warning light is flashing uh, most pronouncedly. Because this is the thing. It takes a particular kind of genius, to paraphrase Nye Bevan, particular kind of genius to institute the most dramatic cuts in public spending uh, for generations, really for generations in this country, and still end up with a deficit that's increasing and borrowing on a historical scale. It takes a particular kind of genius to do that. And it's very clear what's happened here. That the impact of austerity, the impact of this mad smash and grab drive that the government has implemented, and that's really what it is, and I'll come back to the importance of that, that the impact of this thing has pushed down wages, has created insecure work. We live in an increasingly low investment, low pay, insecure economy. The result of which is that no one's earning enough to pay more in taxes. The government is not getting the tax revenue in. As a result, the deficit is widening. So for every cut that they're making over here, you're making the deficit worse over there. Nothing about this, nothing about this makes any sense for most people in this country. And that, of course, is the point. Because this isn't about most people in this country. Not at all. The figures, I think, are increasingly clear. You could take the thousand richest people uh, in Britain who have seen their wealth double uh, in the last four years compared to everybody else falling real wages. It's very clear that austerity, for all the pretension, and you get this a lot with, uh, well, either economists or, or people who like to pretend they know about economics, that you get this pretension that it's all necessary, that it's all part of a plan to get things back on course, to get things to how they should be, to sort out the mess that Labour left, that there is no other alternative, to quote my final uh, person in the gallery of robes, which is, of course, Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative to any of this. You get this pretense that this is necessary and scientific and it's argued for and responsible people in the Treasury and elsewhere are insisting that this has to be done, but of course none of it, none of it is done to benefit us, and all of it is done to benefit a very, very slender group right at the top of society. And that is the kind of economy that we are increasingly led towards living in. It is not one that functions for most people, it is one that runs on something like a smash and grab rate, and quite a successful one.
quite a successful one for the large corporations and for the rich. Profits over this year hitting record levels. Dividend payments to shareholders hitting record levels. Huge gains in the stock exchange. All of these things work out quite nicely for the 1% and even the slender fraction of 1% and 0.1%. All of these things work out quite nicely for them. But what it leaves behind is this weak, enfeebled economy that is probably more exposed to what happens in the rest of the world. More exposed to tremors in the Eurozone, recession in Japan, or for that matter, more exposed to, for instance, another house price crash or something simply going belly up in the city of London here, which looks now, of course, increasingly likely. A less stable, a less robust economy on almost any point you care to mention. You got a glimpse of this, I think, and I did want to sort of throw this in. You got a glimpse of this um, during the referendum campaign when suddenly polls were reporting the possibility. Uh, after, you know, particularly in London, you get this sort of smug assumption that, you know, it was never an Alex Sam joke, uh, yes, joke, uh, you know, we just kind of pat them on the head, dismiss it and move on. Well, well done everyone here for <laughs> thoroughly proving that otherwise. And once the dim realisation starts to sink into, you know, Whitehall and the city, you get this panic about the pound. And this, of course, starts to be the thing that, well, that's because, you know, Scottish independence is, is high risk and all the rest of it. Not a bit of it. Not a bit of it. Just look at the figures. Very, very clear to me that one of the major things that happens if Scotland goes independent is you get North Sea oil. That's yours. And that means that the rest of the country doesn't have North Sea oil exports anymore. And what is already a catastrophically bad current account situation in Britain, that every single year since 1983, we have imported more stuff from the rest of the world than we've sold to the rest of the world. And this, by the way, has happened because we basically wiped out much of manufacturing. This is kind of a long-term issue that we've got here that every year we've done that to the point where the current account deficit has risen since 2008 to the point where it's about 5.5% uh, of GDP. It's at an unsustainable level already. Take out more CO. The rest of the UK economy is completely, completely without any it's solid international foundation at all. And that was what was driving uh, the panic in the pound. It's a glimpse of the kind of issues that I think we're very rapidly heading into. And that austerity is itself marching us down the line towards another crash, towards another major banking failure. It's always slightly, you feel slightly risky, uh, or, or you're doing something slightly unnerving as an economist, that um, you start you know, making predictions or whatever. As J.K. Goldbrook, a great liberal economist in America, said that basically economic forecasting is there to make astrology look good. But rest assured, <laughs> rest assured at this point, that you can't run an economy like this without bumping into serious trouble down the line. So what do you do about all of this? Well, I started with the problems because I think we have to grasp the nettle in this one. And you saw it, I think, some of it in the referendum campaign, the scare about uh, RBS moving its headquarters, which uh, the police, I believe, are now investigating the Treasury, who, who are really the, the, the worst of the worst in all of this. They're investigating the Treasury for leaking the news before RBS had even bothered, the board of RBS had even been able to tell its own shareholders. Um, this, of course, was presented as a terrible thing for Scotland. Not a bit of it. Not a bit of it. Good. If RBS wants to move its headquarters down to London, good. And let's make this a Yes, yeah, sure, keep the branches open, keep the people's jobs. Frankly, employ more people in the branches. Let's have more bank branches. Let's not have, you know, automated computer uh, credit reckoning and all the rest of it. Let's get back to a model of banking. You're going to need banks. You carry on having money. You're going to need somewhere safe to put your money, make the occasional loan. That's what you need. You need that kind of relationship banking. Let's employ more people who are actually doing something useful inside banks, and let's not employ the people at the top who aren't doing anything useful, but are doing very nicely, I think. If RBS moves down to London, you don't have to carry the can when it fails, and it will. You don't have to carry that anymore. Same with any other banks here. I mean, we have to deal with the problem, but that's kind of our lookout. We'll think of something. Um, <laughs> but good. Fine. Close down the large banks. Break them up. It is absolutely obscene that you have institutions of this size and with this influence so closely integrated into national politics, national political life, with such extraordinary influence. You'd have thought, you'd have thought, six years after the crash, with fury, the absolutely correct public fury directed against bankers, it might possibly have turned into a prosecution, it might possibly have turned into a serious clampdown on bonuses, it might possibly have stamped out some of the worst practices, but what, of course, do we see just in the last week? 
yet another banking scandal, including RBS and all the rest is still under investigation in RBS's case, major banks rigging foreign exchange fined £2 billion by the regulator for doing this. None of this has been cleared up. So if you want to get a hand up on the economy, and want to think about what the price of an independent Scotland might be, you can seriously take a broom to what has been happening inside the financial system. You can clear out the spits and the gamblers. You can break up the banks. You can write off their bad assets. You can tell the shareholders in the banks to go hang. You can do all this and get yourself to a financial system that starts to work for the people, rather than the people working for the financial system. That's one of the things you can do. But that means breaking up the banks. That means breaking up their claws, their hold on power. That means breaking up the Westminster system that supports them. You know, my old boss at the Treasury, I won't name him, I'm not going to suggest he's personally corrupt. He uh, was happily, happily taken off to run the nationalised banks in the midst of the crash. Uh, he then went off to one of the private banks. I now look him up the other day. He's back as Deputy Director of the Treasury. There's a revolving door <laughs> in this place that has to be broken. But that's the key to it. This is a political challenge, and it's Scottish independence, and the promise of Scottish independence that enables us <laughs> to make that political challenge, and that's why it's so important. Thank you. Yeah.